Awesome, great. Well, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is March 21st, 2022. It's 11 a.m. and I call this meeting to order. Um, I guess first things first, uh, we are streaming on YouTube. Um, and so anyone that wants to kind of go back and watch our meetings kind of instantaneously, um, you can do that now, uh, which is great. Thank you, Nelly. Um, uh, just a quick update on pre-qualification. So uh, we opened our pre-qualification application window um, last Wednesday. As of this morning, um, we have a total of 253 uh, pre-qualification applications that have been submitted. And um, we haven't started to review them individually. Um, however, as soon as we do, um, and certainly uh, when we start issuing approvals, the plan is to have a tracker on our website um, that will display the number um, and the type of each pre-qualification application that we have approved, which I think will be um, kind of helpful as business information for um, other folks that are seeking um, licenses. So um, we'll be doing that as soon as we kind of uh, catch our breaths and start to review these. Um, I want to remind everyone that pre-qualification is a voluntary process. Um, it is not required to get an operational license. There are certainly some benefits both to the board um, and to the applicant, um, but there's also some downsides. Um, you know, primarily that you'll have to get your fingerprints done twice, um, pay a fee each time uh, with those fingerprints. Um, and also, you know, there's the non-refundable application fee for pre-qualification and it's non-refundable even if you are um, a social equity applicant or even if you end up being disqualified. Um, on payment, on the fee, um, our staff is working on setting up the payment portal through our website um, and a process for receiving um, checks and um, things of that nature. Um, as soon as we're ready to accept fees and we have the authority to, um, to do so, uh, the staff will notify all of the pre-qualified applicants um, directly and kind of walk you through the payment process. Um, also, just, you know, once you've been pre-qualified, there's no need to update your pre-qualification application as you add more principals or financiers or um, owners to your leadership team. Any new additions to really come through your final licensing process. So I know that um, folks continue to have a lot of questions about pre-qualification. Um, you know, the best place to start with any questions is to look at our website. We, we've really been trying to kind of modify the information that's on there in response to people's questions. So go to ccb.vermont.gov forward slash pre-qualify. Um, and if you don't see your answer there, um, you know, you can email the board at ccb.info at vermont.gov. That's kind of the next, the next good step to take. And then, um, of course, we do have a phone number here. Um, you can always call 802-828-1010. Um, and then it's option zero um, for the adult rec market. Um, and you can always leave a message and we'll try our best to get back to you um, properly. Um, I guess uh, just a reminder also that we have filed rules two, three, and four um, as emergency rules last week, meaning that they have been, um, that they are currently in effect. Um, we've spoken um, to the staff of the dispensaries. They all kind of understand what the rules do. Um, we're working on guidance for patients and caregivers and the dispensaries that explains um, kind of the program as it exists under rule three um, and the new statutes. And that guidance um, will be posted to our website by the end of the week. Finally, um, we have a social equity and economic empowerment networking event on Thursday, this Thursday, uh, March 24th from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, we're still operating under the kind of updated public meeting laws, the temporary public meeting laws. So this is going to be an all remote um, meeting, no in-person attendance. 
the link to RSVP is available on our website. And um, Brent, I was wondering maybe if you wanted to just briefly describe um, what the event uh, agenda is going to look like. Yep, sure. So we're going to be doing, um, David and I will be there and we will be doing a high level review of rules one and two. Um, and the purpose will really be to assist people in figuring out what um, they need to have ready for their full license application. So the focus is going to be on what the license application will require. And we'll also go over what the pre-qualification um, application requires too, in case people are interested in that. Um, that will be followed by a Q&A session on the applications, both pre-qualification and full license application. Um, and we'll set out some notes at the beginning of the, of the session, but there will be some limits on what questions we can answer since we really can't offer an opinion on whether a person or an entity um, will be granted a license by the board. So we're not gonna be able to answer specific questions um, about individual or um, business, individual business scenarios, um, but we will be answering sort of general questions about how to interpret the rules and what the application for the license will require. Great. So again, that's uh, this Thursday, March 24th from 5 to 7 p.m. And again, we don't record those. We don't post them. Um, these are not open meetings. Um, you know, there isn't a form of the board there. Um, and really the idea behind that is to encourage participation, encourage open dialogue, encourage open communication. Um, so please, um, you know, try and join if you can. The, the link to RCP is on our website. Other than that, um, we just need to approve the minutes from March 14th, um, our last meeting. Um, Kyle and Julie, have you had a chance to review those? Yep. Yes. Great. Well, I would take a motion to approve. Uh, move to approve the minutes for the last meeting. Seconded. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Well, why don't we turn to the agenda? Um, today, we, um, we've all been kind of looking at some of our packaging uh, rules, and we've been developing guidance on them. Um, I have some slides. Julie, I don't know um, if you have anything you wanted to um, prepare. It, I'm happy to kind of take your lead if you want to go first or second or third. Do you have any um, preference? I, I don't have a preference and I do have slides. I have so some it's... slides too. I have some slides yeah. too. Well, why don't I get started? I've got some stuff. I've got some slides just on the material side of thing, what the packaging materials need to be. And so why don't I get started? And um, you and Kyle can fight it out for who goes next. Okay, packaging guidance. So this is just a recap um, of what we said about packaging um, in rule 2.2.9. Um, so the following requirements apply to all cannabis and cannabis product packaging. Um, so this is really about those kind of cross references you are really about labeling. Um, but also clearly identifying the package content, contents, be free from false or misleading statements, not using um, objects that essentially appeal to minors or people under the age of 21. And then the second part is the kind of operative part of my slides, is that packaging that is intended for consumer purchase at a retail location shall be reusable and shall not be plastic. So I've got some kind of guidance on that, that piece of things. So we don't have a definition of packaging in our rules. I thought it'd be helpful um, only because, you know, we now are starting to see a difference between, we're starting to identify a difference between packaging that's meant for consumer uh, sale versus interest supply chain transferring of products between licensees. So I just wanted to make that clear in our guidance um, that, Packaging really uh, means um, when I talk when we talk about packaging, 
and non-plastic, reusable. We're really talking about anything that's intended for consumer sale. And it really doesn't mean um, the kind of shipping containers or vacuum sealed um, kind of fat plastic bags that um, licensees may use uh, within the supply chain. So in general, I mean, I think it's important that packages um, are designed to protect um, the product from contamination um, and uh, shouldn't expose the cannabis or cannabis products to toxics or harmful substances. Um, and that the packaging not appeal to people under the age of 21. I know this is directly in our rules, but I think it's good to kind of, if we have a standalone guidance document, just to remind people of these things. Um, so the language under uh, under B here that uses objects such as toys, inflatable movie characters, cartoon characters, et cetera, that is straight out of our rules. Um, you know, I, there's a document that um, a group, the, like a cannabis um, association put together, it involves kind of some of our consultants as well, that has model definitions. There is a kind of model definition of a cartoon character um, that we could look at. I didn't include it here, but you know, I think that's where things get a little bit fuzzy on this, considering a lot of um, what we see in the craft beer industry does actually use what could be characterized as cartoon characters. Um, but um, I don't know if we want to get that descriptive or not here in our guidance. Julie, do you have any thoughts on that or Kyle? I do. I think the part of this that I covered was kind of like that look, like what is a cartoon and what isn't. Um, okay. So we can talk about it more, although I would like to know, I didn't find the, the, the cartoon character definition. So that would be probably a good thing to continue um, to talk about. I think the way I framed it was things that are uh, generally marketed to children or generally marketed yeah. to youth under the age of 21. Well, when we transition to your slides, Julie, I'll pull up the kind of model definition that this organization put to, put forward. Yeah, that'd be good. See if it, yeah. Okay. So, I in I'm envisioning a, regi a product registration process. We do have a product registration fee, um, and so I think the kind of product registration process will give us the opportunity to review um, whether something is in compliance with um, our guidance and our rules on packaging. Um, so just, you know, this basic guidance just says, you know, if you're going to develop a package or, or a label, you know, it has to go through a CCB product registration process. One thing that, you know, a lot of other adult use states do, um, including Oregon and Massachusetts, is they maintain a list on their websites of all packaging that's been approved. And so, you know, if you don't want to kind of have any questions about whether your packaging is okay or not, you can go to this list and see all the packaging that the board has approved. And you can use that, you know, if we apply a certain waiver and I have a waiver pr provision later on, if we grant a waiver for a, um, a product um, packaging that includes a de minimis amount of plastic, for instance, that packaging will be approved for the entire industry. So I think that that, you know, this, that's the kind of vision that I'm laying out here. It's kind of central to this. So just a reminder that there is under current law required that all packaging be opaque and child resistant. Um, you know, I think H548, um, which passed the, the house last week, um, eliminates the need for cannabis, um, which would include the seeds and immature plants from being an opaque child resistant packaging. So I think in our guidance, this, you know, we should be clear about that, but, you know, obviously it's dependent on whether 548 actually passes. Um, so that first line is kind of up in the air currently, but certainly for cannabis products, um, they must be opaque and in child resistant packaging. And then, you know, another, another kind of model, um, 
you know, guidance or rule is that if if a edible, for instance, contains multiple servings, that the child resistant packaging must be capable of being resealed and the child resistance must be kind of sustainable at least as many times as the number of units in that product. So again, if you had the, a tincture that had, you know, 100 servings in it or something or 10, 15 servings, the, the, the lid would have to be child resistant for at least 10 uses. And then here's just some, again, from that model document, those model definitions, some, some definitions of opaque. Um, the child resistant packaging actually just comes from our statute. Um, that was defined in Act 164. So, uh, but opaque um, just means that the contents can't be seen um, in an unopened container and that, you know, it could be just the specific properties of the container or it could be put a sticker over it. Um, And then child resistant packaging. This very closely mirrors the federal um, definition of child resistant packaging, but it's essentially it's difficult, not impossible, but difficult for a child under five. Um, whereas um, it's not people above that can still, it, but kind of not difficult for normal normal adults to use properly. So getting to the prohibition on plastic and um, non-reusable packaging. So just re reiterating that packaging that is intended for consumer purchase at a retail location shall be reusable and shall not be plastic. That's in our rules 2.2.9. Um, I just threw in a quick definition of reusable. Um, reusable means packaging that's capable of repeated recovery, inspection, sanitation, repair if necessary, and reuse in the supply chain. I guess I should get rid of a reissue for reuse. Yep. Plastic, that's just the definition of plastic from our rules, uh, from rule two. And then I think, you know, I think it's going to be important for us to kind of push people in certain directions here as to kind of reusable, non plastic. So, you know, glass, tin, cardboard, and bamboo. We could say also, just as a catch-all, anything that's been approved pursuant to our product registration process or packaging re registration process. And then glass, tin, cardboard, and bamboo, just by the way, are the most commonly non-plastic. Uh, you know, if you look on Ma Massachusetts or Oregon, those are the kind of materials that are most commonly used as alternatives to plastic. So just recognizing that, um, you know, plastic in some form might be uh, necessary um, for certain reasons. Um, we have kind of talked about having a case by case waiver process. So this is kind of, and this is obviously up for debate. This is um, something that we need to figure out um, and kind of understand the um, kind of actual demands of the market. But um, this is this is my first attempt at this. Um, so a licensee may seek a waiver to the plastic prohibition if the licensee can demonstrate hardship in securing non-plastic packaging. And then I list the three reasons why um, that we would accept as a reasonable kind of hardship. Um, so one is the unavailability of non-plastic packaging, um, which I have heard certain products just, you know, they require a certain amount of plastic and there's no viable alternatives um, currently. Um, two would be an inability to achieve child resistance without some amount of plastic. Um, and then third would be it's necessary to preserve shelf life stability, prevent contamination of cannabis or cannabis products. Um, and then finally, avoid exposure of cannabis and cannabis products to toxic or harmful substances. So through the product registration process, we would expect licensees to kind of submit a waiver petition essentially um, for their specific packaging. Um, and I'll come back to this slide in a second, but just moving on because the, the waiver petition would also need to include 
a packaging alternative that uses de minimis plastic. And de minimis plastic for the purposes of this kind of waiver is only the amount of plastic that's reasonably needed to overcome the hardship that they've identified through their kind of initial waiver. Um, and then um, in addition, you know, the licensee should propose packaging alternatives that prioritize certain types of plastic. First, plant-based recyclable um, plastic or reclaimed plastic. And finally, um, you know, the licensee must submit a plan for complying with the non-plastic reusable packaging requirements. So how are you going to try and phase out this plastic? How are you going to try and come into compliance uh, with rule 2.2.9? You want me to quickly just talk about <clears throat> the, the conundrum of bioplastics and yes. recyclable bioplastics Please. versus compostable bioplastics? Yeah, you know that packaging alternatives that prioritize certain types of plastic I don't know the right. Yeah. I, yeah. I used to work with with, with bioplastics um, in DC, so I'm a little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to understanding nuance. Because I think a lot of folks have have come to us, or have you know at least or packagers in this industry have started moving towards a a bio based alternative as it relates to plastic usage, recognizing that you know a, a lot of folks want to see plastic move out of the industry, but it's understanding where the industry currently is. I think a, a, a problem unique to Vermont, I mean, it may exist elsewhere, is we don't currently have any composters in state willing to accept bioplastics that are compostable. Essentially, when you're when we think of bioplastics, people automatically think biodegradable and compostable. That's not always the case. There's kind of two routes that bioplastics take in mimicking traditional uh, petroleum-based polymers. There's the PET route, which is recyclable plastic. Um, Coca-Cola had a plant bottle out um, for a number of years. You might have seen it. It was the green Coca-Cola label. Um, that was recyclable plastic. It was bio PET. So it was not compostable under industrial composting, you know, standards. You still had to recycle it through through a recycler. Um, PLA, which is a very common um, polymer, um, does compost under a specific set of conditions at an industrial level. Um, composters in this state have just decided that the infrastructure with which they're currently operating, um, it really messes up what they're trying to accomplish while composting. And you can kind of equate it to, you know, if anybody has any small engines at their house, whether it's a snowblower or a rototiller or a marine engine, if you put high ethanol get, uh, fuel into those, it, it really gunks up the system. And, and think about it in the same type of context. We just, uh, the, the industry isn't there to accept, um, you know, high amounts of bio-based PLA or something along those lines because it kind of messes up everything else they're trying to accomplish from a more organic matter perspective. So, you know, in, in thinking about the non-plastic alternatives and uh, uh, um, alternatives to bio or to petroleum-based plastics, when we were having these conversations, you know, I think it would be great if we could move in a certain direction with in relation to hemp plastic or bioplastic, but recognizing if we set people up to buy those products and put them into a stream of commerce and they just get landfilled anyways, then, then what was really the point? So I, I don't necessarily know what kind of bio PET, bio-based um, recyclable products there are for this industry. I haven't done a wide net search. Um, I'm sure that they're out there. I know a lot of hemp um, plastics are the PLA route. Um, and so they would just end up getting landfilled if we use them in this context anyways. So um, I just want folks to recognize that, you know, we know a little bit a lot of, about a lot of things, not everything about this, um, but when we get the question on bio-based packaging, it's because uh, other folks in the state won't accept those at their compost facilities. And now, you know, I think the last one sunsetted their ability to take plastics on December 30, or bioplastics on December 31st. So that's why recyclable plant-based products are in here and not, you know, the way we more naturally think about bioproducts, which is in a biodegradable fashion. Does so that make sense? It does. I, I'm, you know, so is plant-based the right terminology yeah. to use? Yeah. There's a lot of corn-based um, and other kind of more commodity crop-oriented PET types of plastic that service Markets, generally speaking, I just don't know 
from a cannabis industry perspective, are there bio companies making PET for uh, packaging for cannabis? That I, I can't answer that question, but there are major companies out there making PET recyclable bioplastics. Um, and then there's other ones making compostable ones that are more of the PLA route. And then just one other question, like, because I had obviously have been going back and forth in my head whether to include some terminology around biodegradable and or compostable. And I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm just I'm curious if those compostable or biodegradable products end up in the landfill anyway. Um, is there any benefit to having a biodegradable, something that's biodegradable in the landfill versus something that's non biodegradable? No, yeah, and I, and I understand that question, and I think uh, it's more nuanced than that, and I think we'd have to talk to folks that operate those businesses here because I don't know what type of landfill setup they have because, you know, biodegradable or compostable bioplastics, they're not like, you know, an, a banana peel that you throw out, and it, it degrades under the, the, the set of weather circumstances that we, you know, have in our natural environment. It needs to be under very specific conditions, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic digestion, that really suck the oxygen out of what's going on and allow it to break down in, in a different way. And I just don't know how we're set up from a landfilling perspective, recognizing I think we have one landfill in the state. If they are set up in a way um, for those products, to, even if they do end up in the landfill, to break down as we think organic matter does break down. And, and this is the, the push and pull between whether bioplastics are really worth it. <laughs> To some environmentalists or not you know what i mean yeah. so that to me seems like the right language then prioritize plant-based recyclable or reclaimed plastic yeah I, I i think so i think you know there's a lot of i know that there's companies um in this industry that are using reclaimed ocean plastic to um to formulate um you know containers whatever you want to call it for this industry. Um, I think if, 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 if a retailer is looking to do that, you know, that's different than a single use petroleum based plastic and we can provide special accommodation or, or through the waiver process or whatever the case may be, because there is a lot of companies moving in that, that direction, in addition to the bio-based plastic direction. That's not included here though, Pepper, is it? Reclaimed ocean plastic would not, that's not included well, in your- I say packaging alternatives that prioritize the plant-based recyclable or reclaimed plastic. So yeah, I mean it's it's still plastic. You potentially would have to to seek a waiver, and you know I I know for a fact there's companies out there that are trying to pivot in this direction, and, that, and not least looking at you know the single-use variety. It, 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 but then again, it's like, what's your definition of single-use? And we'll get to this in some of my slides when it comes to you know the collection and reuse of. Com Com, uh, consumer packaging waste, but is that single use plastic at the point thinking about the life of that plastic or single use in the context of its use in this industry? Right. And so it gets a little convoluted and wonky, but um, you know, it's again still a step in the right direction, I think. Julie, do you have any thoughts about this slide? I don't. I had, about, the same, I had the same oh, question yeah. as you about the if it goes to a landfill, is does it still break down? So thank you for answering, Kyle. The answer is, it depends. <laughs> That's my lawyer answer for the day. So then this is the other kind of like the big one, which is just the three, three reasons why you could seek a waiver. Yeah. We feel like these are sufficient to kind of cover the, the potential need. Yeah, yes. I mean, from my, from my perspective, you know, I think we're we're a little bit ahead of the curve from an industry perspective on trying to move plastics out of the retailer supply chain. And I think two of those major reasons are shelf life stability and child resistant packaging. And, um, you know, depending on what happens at the legislature for flour, you know, it kind of alleviates some of my concerns around child resistant packaging and being able to reuse materials that, you know, it's harder to guarantee that CR requirement after its first life. Um, and, and to an extent, it does the same thing for 
the shelf life stability. I think that's really where, um, you know, plastic for better or worse does a really good job of, of maintaining moisture content um, and making sure that that product is a marketable product um, throughout its, its actual, you know, life as a cannabis product and it doesn't degrade because of the packaging itself. And do you think, I mean, I know we had this conversation, but that ability for retailers to package for consumers, I think. I think that that helps. I think that helps there. I think we might see, you know, some lids that have a seal on it or some films that go over the entire packaging. We might get waivers um, depending on the product for that. And we can have that conversation when the time comes. But, you know, you know, or like, you know, there's cardboard packaging for flour and for vape carts and stuff that have a, a plastic push button, right. you know, that's like, that acts as like the child resistant thing. And, you know, those are like, for me would be a de minimis amount of plastic. So it's just kind of recognizing, I think people and regulators and, and industry professionals that I've talked to about this issue recognize what we're trying to do and think it's a cool direction to move in. Um, but we need to recognize where the industry currently is and packages are not gonna, you know, redo their entire supply chains to meet a market as small as Vermont's. But, you know, it's, again, it's like these cool ideas happen in small state laboratories and, you know, spread once it's successful, hopefully. Great. Well, I think, I think this, this is a process that will work. Um, and again, I think the idea is, you know, if someone goes through this waiver provision and we have an approved kind of package, you know, that that package could be used by other people that are, that, that want to use it. Um, so, all right, well, that's all that I had on, on packaging. Um, you know, having seen these slides, Julie or Kyle, do you think your slides should come next? I have collection and reuse of consumer packaging waste, Julie. So if you think that's a natural segue, I can go. That seems like the direction we're going, yes. Okay. So, yeah, this is, um, you know, one of the schemes that we put into our, our regulations. And I, the first two slides are kind of what is mentioned in our regulations. And we're, we're piggybacking off of predominantly what Colorado is, is attempting to do. And in my conversations with the regulators in Colorado, um, they don't have a lot of guidance out on this because it's fairly new for them as well and trying to figure out certain things. But and, and we did leave out some stuff that Colorado has like a locked container, um, you know, in the facility. We, we just thought that was a little, a little much. I don't think people will be, you know, trying to hit the bargain bin and reaching in and trying to, to take out plastics <laughs> or, or containers that have a very, you know, dusting of cannabis product inside them. Maybe they had better reasons, but um, who knows? So this is what's in our, our regulations, retail Cannabis establishments may collect, reuse, recycle cannabis packaging waste. Only retail cannabis establishments may collect consumer packaging waste for reuse and recycling. They need to collect consumer packaging waste from consumers uh, or from other licensees. Um, they should be located in the cannabis establishment, subject such they are subject to the same security measures as the rest of the establishment. Um, reasonably supervised by a licensee to ensure any consumer packaging waste is only removed by a licensee. Um, the recepti receptacles need to be labeled, um, clearly stating that it's consumer packaging waste. And, you know, you can include additional waste if you so want to. A little bit more about what was in our rules. This is where I start to kind of conceptualize, you know, what requirements apply for actually trying to do this. Obviously, the major one that comes to mind is sanitizing and disinfecting. So who can sanitize? You know, I'm proposing that the retail cannabis establishment um, can set SOPs up um, to do this themselves or hire a third party to do so. Um, and, you know, I think with that, we would we would like to see 
certain information be made available to us or other state officials upon request or inspection, no matter if you're looking to stand up and do this in-house um, contracts and receipts related to collection and a third party helping you out here. But I know Colorado allows for third parties to do, um, you know, this to, to, to service this industry. And I think it would be proper for us to do as well. I think really here, um, good business records and SOPs are what's really going to help drive this. Um, I think it, you know, this needs to be standardized across retailers and their employees, making sure that they're doing this in a correct manner. Um, and what what I've really done and kind of looked through is um, uh, the produce safety rule at the Agency of Agriculture, how you clean um, certain receptacles as it relates to an ag product. And I've perused the health department's website for similar language. Um, it's a little harder to find on the health website because there's other topics that dominate given the state of the world, um, that website. But I'm still, this is a starting point. We can kind of further define this moving forward. Um, you know, I think within your SAP, SOPs, they need to be posted clear um, nearby for employees that are looking to do this. You know, restock cleaning supplies like brushes, detergents, and sanitizers that are labeled um, for use. Dedicated locations for clean and dirty items. Um, a cleaning log might be helpful as well. And I'm thinking these SOPs don't need to be you know, we don't need to have these on file per se, but I think in the, in the course of inspection or if we do receive a complaint, these need to be kept and given to us on request or the health department upon request. Um, that's why I put other state aid officials in here um, in case that there is a problem um, through the course of this, this part of the program. So child resistant containers, again, you know. Um, How can I ask a quick question about yeah. the SOPs and um, sure. Let me think about how to frame this. So, <clears throat> you know, if we had to stop sale on something, how would we how would we know if it's <clears throat> from the content of the package or because the package wasn't clean? Like if there was an issue um, and this I, I don't know that this is a guidance question or something that we just need to think about for a future conversation, but how would we know if there was an issue with a product in the package or if the, there's the package itself, what hadn't been properly cleaned? Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that question off the top of my head. I think whenever we get a compliance and enforcement staff in house, um, I'm hopeful that, you know, when we do get those questions, we can develop our own SOPs to start eliminating, you know, factors that might go into understanding what really is the root of the problem you know um i don't know if that's a an answer that's helpful right now <laughs> but no well you know. it was just something that came up as you were in my mind as you were talking and that we probably need to think about i mean yeah it could be the product it could be the packaging itself it could be insufficient cleaning of that package and um i mean julie one thing i you know, when Kyle talks about the third party, when I was looking at this question, I did notice there are a number of third party companies, um, not in necessarily in Vermont, that specialize in san collecting and sanitizing cannabis consumer waste for reuse. Um, and so they certainly have their kind of, you know, SOPs worked out. And maybe it's either we rely on those um, companies and how they do it, uh, or we rely on their procedures um, in our guidance for how to do this. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I think retailers that want to do this, we're not reinventing the wheel. There is, you know, opportunities to connect with those third parties. They've likely, unless they have a presence in Vermont, you can't ship your right. your waste out of state. But um, I, I'd imagine there are going to be some ancillary businesses that might pop up that, to service this, this part of the market. Um, or if you bring it in house, just just leaning on their expertise and how they operate to kind of ensure that this, you know, doesn't become an issue like you mentioned, Julie. Yeah. OK, thank you. I don't have all the answers right now. <laughs> so, we'll get them all eventually. And this is just more, um, you know, visual inspection, especially with the child resistant packaging requirements for cannabis products. 
Um, but the container um, visual inspection requirement rings true for others as well. It should not have, be brittle or have chips, cracks, or other imperfections that could compromise CR or shelf life stability or throws a pet uh, or pose a threat to a public harm. You know, if depending on certain things happening, if, if a mason jar is allowed, you know, for cannabis flower and it has a crack in it and you can cut yourself on that, um, seems like that one should just be retired <laughs> instead of reused, you know, just a little bit of, of common sense. But, you know, I think one of the challenges that I know Colorado and, and packagers have encountered with these take back programs that you clean the, the way that these are cleaned and disinfected um, a lot of packagers will not certify that the CR requirement will will hold beyond the first use or the you know the first retail use of these packaging so um, there's got to be some some type of standard operating procedures for identifying um, you know, certain things, depending on if your packager, your your relationship with that packager as a retailer, you know, they might not certify that it's CR uh, beyond the first use. And, and how do we dispose of certain um, items that might not be able to qualify moving forward? Um, and then I would I would submit that ANR DEC, I know, is working on lithium ion battery waste issues and, and rules and guidance um, for those batteries as they become more prevalent in our everyday life. So, I mean, if you have a vape cartridge with a battery attached to it, I mean, you can't resell those batteries. That that falls outside of our jurisdiction, and those need to be separated in the cleaning process. Um, as of right now, that's that's really all I've got. That's great. No, and, you know, I, one thing that this whole conversation kind of brings to mind is we, we recognize that this is a voluntary take, you know, program that we're talking about, this kind of retailers being to, able to collect, sanitize and reuse. I'm wondering um, if we could tie this into our positive impact criteria, that this is one of those things If you do this, um, if, it's, if you kind of. I think are, it would it would be easy to, yeah. you know, because we have the environmental, right. you exactly. know, criteria already. And. And quite honestly, between our views on plastic here, potential child resistance, packaging changing, and the take back scheme, this could this could be one of the most forward thinking retailer packaging regimes um, in the country, if not the right, you know, most forward thinking one. Yeah, I've noticed in California where they have programs like this, um, you know, some some retailers they're not required to, but they're going you know, as part of their image and part of their commitment to environmental sustainability, have like, you bring back your packaging, you can have a, you know, a, a dollar discount right. or something, you know, like some sort of discount um, for that, for the next purchase. You know, that I think a plan like that could easily fit into our positive impact criteria requirements. Yeah. I mean, I think retailer retailers will get creative here. Yeah. Um, and that's really where good innovation is. Yeah is meets you know where you know forward thinking regulation can really meet business from an innovation perspective and really see market dynamics start to change you know that being said i think we're all again cognizant that you know we're a little bit ahead of where the industry is um but that's why we have waiver provisions to kind of meet people where things are now hoping that we can get to a certain place in the future that's my perspective this is great um any questions, Julie? No, this looks great, Kyle. Thank you. Great. OK. So my piece of this was really around um, the consumer labeling and packaging, and it should be coming up. We can see that. OK, perfect. So I don't need to go through the, the rule again. Thank you, for Pepper, for setting the table for us. Um, and that I did, um, in the guidance that I started working on, I did break down what a false or misleading statement might include. Um, and then also what, you know, sort of the toys and cartoons might include. So for false or misleading statements, I said, you know, physical or psychological effect that associates cannabis consumption with improving a lifestyle, hobby or activity. So one couldn't say, uh, you know, on their packaging that if you use this product, you become better at, you know, 
fill in the blank particular activity or lifestyle. Um, and that, uh, you know, promising something like that or promising a, a curative effect of the product would be a false or misleading statement. And then for the not using the objects um, that appeal to minors, I think I said, and we were talking about this before, Pepper, um, avoid images or language popular with youth under 21, such as cartoon catchphrases or general design that resembles characters popular with youth. You know, we could also say, and then the next one talks about images of food um, candy or other items that are commonly marketed to children. So that seemed pretty clear. What was the um, the definition that you had, Pepper, for a cartoon character? Yeah. Here, I'll pull I'll pull it up. If you don't mind, should I should I just do that quickly? Yep. Okay. Because I thought back to the last conversation that we had about this in November, and I do remember talking about, um, you know, one of the local breweries and their their can. And I, I, I suspect this will be a little bit subjective because some of it is cartoony, but not necessarily in a way that would appeal to children. Right. So that is sort right. of a gray area. So this is. Um... This is one that this is kind of a, a model definition that this group of industry experts came up with with respect to cannabis. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the best definition. It's just there is a, a working group that specifically looked at this. Um, and so, again, it's kind of. Comically exaggerated features, attribution of human characters, characteristics to animals, plants or objects um, in the in the attribution of unnatural or extra human abilities, such as imperviousness to pain or injury, extra vision, high tunneling at high speeds or transformation. You know, I'm fine with whatever, however we land on this, honestly, it's, uh, whether we need a definition of a cartoon or we kind of know it when we see it, you know, I don't know if that, like, again, even with the definition, this is very subjective, you know? <laughs> Comically exaggerated features. Well, that depends on the. That's in the eyes of the beholder. Um, so, but anyway, I figured I. I just came across this. I thought it might be helpful um, for the conversation because again, cartoon. Yeah, like any Lawson's can looks a little cartoonish to me. Um, but for any kind of alchemy, alchemist can, you know. So. Right, but does that appeal to children is the question, right? So, yeah. like, I would say, like, the alchemist can, the one I'm thinking of, like, it's a cartoon, but it's, I think it would be scary to young children, right? <laughs> you know what I it mean? Might like, it's, some it, it might. Yeah. Like, sit from Toy Story. <laughs> yeah, and trying to kind of characterize as something that appeals to someone who's under 21 versus over 21 is very challenging. Or 21 you know. versus five, right? So right, exactly. There's a huge, you know, what's a cartoon that appeals to a five-year-old or a 21-year-old? There's a huge array there. Right. So, yeah. yes, I agree. Okay. Well, I just figured this is somewhat relevant. I don't, I'm not suggesting we adopt this, but I figured I'd throw it up there for you to see. Yeah. So, um, and I think we can work in some of those pieces to this. I think that would be helpful. Um, so then sort of based on that conversation, I tried to find some things that we could put in guidance that were clearly unacceptable and some things that were clearly acceptable. Um, so I think what's helpful to this conversation is, do we all agree on that? Like, it, you know, given that this is so subjective and we're gonna have to approve eventually advertising, you know, I think we would probably agree that all of these on this slide are generally not acceptable. They they definitely like there's one that sort of looks like a Disney Mickey, so it, it that would definitely be advertised towards children. You know, there's one that sort of adopts another look of another candy that's typically advertised towards children. So I think do you all agree that these are things that would be generally not acceptable based on our guidance and rules? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so then I tried to find some that were 
acceptable, like not that we would necessarily use these specific images in our guidance, but um, I think all these would be acceptable. The one that I think is sort of like maybe on the line and sort of like what we're talking about um, with the the beer cans is the um, shipyard THC elixir. Like that's a little cartoony. Watch out for pumpkin head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make it clear also that we, we're not allowed to have THC infused drinks. But yes, I know that so this is just a model. Yeah. That's not, there's no actual, um, that's not alcohol. It's only a THC elixir. So there's no alcohol in that particular item. Yeah. Although it is made by a brewer. Yeah, so, I mean, for the most part, these look pretty, yeah, pretty standard. It's a blurry line. It's, you know, right. It's again, it's hard to set procedures necessarily in place. It's like, you know, you see it. Yeah. So then if we all are comfortable with that, so I think I'll use some examples in the guidance based on that. And then um, just as a reminder, these are our, our warning labels and symbols. I think I tried to get these as pretty close to like actual size, so they'll look smaller to you all on the screen than they typically do. But based on what's written in our rules, this is this is pretty close to the size that we require. Um, and then the other policy point that we probably should talk about is um, the warning labels. We've left um, a lot of flexibility in our rule in terms of how this could be affixed to a product. So in our guidance, I think we can say things like, you know, it could certainly be directly printed on the package or secured with a sticker. So um, I'm thinking of sometimes you get a um, something from the pharmacy where the sticker is almost like a tag on a on a package. So I think that could potentially be acceptable. Also like a peel away label, like you see with some things have, you know, you peel away the label and the warnings on the inside. Um, and that we want to say that the warning label is clearly readable on the package somewhere, whether it's peeled away and you can clearly read it or affixed with a sticker and you can read it. Are you both comfortable with those as um, guidance for how folks can put the, the warning label on the packaging? I'm fine with the sticker, but as far as that contains THC, um, can you go back one, one slide? Yeah, contains THC and not safe for kids. I don't think that that can be obscured in any way. Yeah. No, I like no, I. Would, yeah. Yep, this would just be this warning label. The this longer, yeah. um, you know, it is not this 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 section here. This warning label. These yep. other things do have to be um, clear, clearly placed on the packaging, where it can be seen when you pick the packaging up. In my opinion. Um, I think that's kind of consistent with what we've talked about throughout, but it was just this larger warning label that I thought we could have some flexibility on. Yeah, that's, that's fine with me, um, especially just recognizing that um, some packaging is going to be so small that the, the notion of trying to like put that warning label on it um, without having some sort of accommodation uh, is going to be quite challenging. Um, and then the last piece I'll just share with you is a guidance checklist. So this came out of the um, public health uh, subcommittee um, from back in the fall when we were talking about um, the uh, warning labels and symbols in general. And so this was kind of like the last piece that NACB shared with us. It doesn't, the, what they shared with us doesn't look exactly like this. I separated it out to kind of match our rules. Um, and this is a draft. So it, they're probably, um, there are probably some spelling errors in it but it is a draft and we'll have a checklist in our guidance so that people can kind of go through and say okay i've met all these things before they submit anything sounds good that was it for me that's great all right well, um, I guess, uh, you know, just looking at the agenda, um, that's kind of 
the main item. Um, we have public comment um, next. So i um, happy to open this up to public comment. Um, again, we will start as we usually do with people that join by the link. Um, please raise your virtual hand. Uh, we'll go in the order that you raise your hand and then um, we will move to folks that joined on the phone. So Nellie, maybe you could help us out with the, the order. Yep. Amelia is up first. Hey everybody. So um, I do packaging design for a living. Uh, I do branding, I do marketing, all of that stuff. And I'm holding a bunch of concentrate jars right now that are childproof. Um, they look like this. They're glass on the bottom, plastic on the top. You pinch here and that's how they open. They have a plastic lid. So my thought, and I know a lot of growers that are using this exact concentrate jar right now. My thought there is maybe prohibiting plastic altogether right out the gate is putting the cart ahead of the horse. And while I want us, and I've, I've obviously advocated for this already, while I want to see us go fully uh, recyclable, compostable, sustainable packaging, I think at first, if you give maybe a percentage of packaging that can be plastic, that we can then lower through the next like two to three years. So this would be fine if you said that your packaging can't be more than 30% plastic. But if you're saying that none of this can be plastic, then every single person who's bought 5,000 of these in anticipation for the market, I know they shouldn't have done that because the packaging requirements haven't come out yet, but people are doing their best right now. The people that have bought five, 10,000 of these, it's going to waste now. Um, I think that as far as, you know, I've already said, as far as childproof packaging goes, it's not accessible to people with disabilities. I know that you guys can't do much about needing childproof packaging. I know it's in statute and you have to do it. It's not accessible to people with disabilities, to people with arthritis, to people with mobile disorders. Um, and as far as, you know, alternatives, sustainable alternatives that are also childproof, we're going to see a lot of the same packaging on shelves from different companies. And it's going to be hard to differentiate between each company's product if everybody's using the same two or three companies for their packaging. Um, and then as far as, the the actual graphics are concerned um i would take a look at burlington beer company and the cans that they put out because i've got their website open right now and they have wizards they have cartoon monkeys they have cartoon clouds they've got petal prophecy which is this really pretty can with that's like purple and it's got all these cartoons like I think that, again, and I know that I say this a lot, and I'm sorry to beat a dead horse, but the CCB's job is not to parent children. And you can only do so much to keep cannabis out of the hands of kids. Um, and as far as packaging goes, I agree. Don't use licensed cartoon characters, you know, or licensed anything. That's a lawsuit waiting to happen, regardless of whether it's being advertised to children or not. Um, but when you get down to is this specific facet of the packaging design advertising to people over the age of 21? You are splitting so many hairs there. Um, I think that there is a level of common sense that can be used here. Uh, and there's also a level of parental responsibility that the CCB should not be having to take on. It is not your responsibility to make sure that individual children are not getting into their parents' cannabis. It is parents' responsibilities to ensure that they are storing their cannabis in a way that the children can't get a hold of it. Um, and that's that's really the biggest thing I wanted to say. I have a graphic designer. So looking at the warning labels and looking at all of these requirements, like, damn, damn, I would, I, I would not want to be the person designing a lot of this packaging right now. Um, and I know a lot of other graphic designers who specifically do cannabis packaging who are worried right now that they're going to have to turn their focus to other areas because of the restrictions that are going to be placed on them in terms of design. Um, yeah, so those are my two biggest things right now. <laughs> that there is a way to slowly go into, you know, a, a sustainable waste-free plant-based packaging while also keeping in mind that a lot of people have started buying their packaging. Um, because all of this is coming up really quick. 
growers have not gotten a lot of final information and so they're just doing the best they can right now so that when they can finally open up their businesses they can compete with the dispensaries that have had the head start above them um i think that as far as design goes and what is or is not advertising to children there's a level of common sense there um and i also think that there are other companies that are in the alcohol space that are not nearly as restrictive as a lot of what is being placed on cannabis is specifically in vermont um and just one last thing and then i'll turn it over in the warning label uh, we've got not safe or do not use if you are breastfeeding um and the science on that is still up in the air and you all know jesse lynn she just went to israel to speak in an international conference about how cannabis is safe for breastfeeding and chest feeding parents and internationally like it, I just I just can't see how we're putting warnings on this when the science isn't there to support them. The science isn't there to support a lot of the claims that we're making because this isn't federally funded. So we don't have federally funded studies, but we do have international studies that we can look to to see whether or not the information that we're putting on these warning labels is actually factual. Um, yeah, so that's my rant. I'm sorry to take up so much time, uh, but thank you for letting me speak. Thanks, Amelia. Ebo. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, love the way things are going. I just wanted to a few things um, on the recycled packaging, um, which I'm really excited to be able to do that. You know, I was planning on opening a dispensary, but I seem it seems to me that it would make more sense for the manufacturers to somehow get that packaging back versus the retail stores, right? Like if I'm selling Mr. Z's flour. I think it would make sense for those jars to be able to go back to them somehow and then use them to repackage. I mean, unless I'm not understanding things correctly, we're not packaging stuff at the dispensary level anyway. So, you know, for us to be to have all these jars or whatever, which is pretty much the only thing you're going to be able to reuse, I would think um, somehow that needs to be able to get back to the manufacturer so they can put their product back in it, I think would be smart, especially if people have like branded jars or whatever, you know, so it's really better for them to get them back than for me to get them back and try to figure out what to do with them. Um, also, the, yeah, the cartoon thing is crazy, right? Illustrated logos have been around forever. Um, you know, I think not using cartoons, similar to what the, the last speaker was saying, that's a licensed cartoon or a kid's cartoon is, is great, but, you know, let people represent their brand the way they want to represent it and, you know, however creative that may be or whatever you know it's just um that gives you true brand identity and i think that's really important for our space um that's it thank you thanks ebo miguel lopez hey good afternoon ccb i just had a quick question just doing the straight cultivating i just was wondering what am i required to uh, like if i wanted to package my flour into glass jars take it to the retailer and then just once he's done with that then just pick them back up and kind of do the recycle program what what how do i have to package it in order to get it to the retailer all right thanks for the comment um again we don't generally answer questions directly during the public comment period uh, but um, we will note that question and you know, I think our guidance will be very clear on that. Um, okay, no, thank you. I just had that, that's just my one concern was just wondering how I need to um, prepare it or what my options are just so I can get it to the retailer. Yeah, so um, again, I think packaging describes what's going to the consumer, not to other licensees. And so all of the restrictions that you're hearing about packaging really apply not to cultivators unless you're packaging direct for consumer sale. Um, okay. Well, in, in that sense, then going with like, I know that the um, Vermont Growers is, is uh, I think bringing up about on the smallest tiers about them being able to do direct sales too. I know it's not nothing in place, but how is that, how is that going to ha um, hash out, I guess, to where can someone with like a tier one, is there going to be anything in place where we can go directly sales direct to the consumer? No. 
Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks for the comment. And, um, you know, just stay tuned. Keep keep tuning in to our meetings or and if you have any direct questions like that, you can always email CC info dot CCB dot or at Vermont dot gov. And CCB dot info. CCB dot info. I always, I always forget it. So. Perfect. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Tito. Hi everybody, happy Monday. Um, I want to say that I agree with Amelia. She made a ton of great points. Uh, also, a great point by Evo there as well. Um, feels like you know, since the, the growers need to do the packaging anyway, unless they have a wholesale license, getting them the jars back seems like something we want to figure out. Um, and you know, um, I like where Amelia was going too, with just like you know, picking somewhere to start, and then you know, and then maybe making it a progressively better system as we go along as far as plastic goes. And um, on that note, I think making an exception from the beginning for the lid and the label seems to solve a lot of problems. So as long as the package itself isn't plastic, um, you know, that, that seems to solve the childproof problem. Um, and, uh, you know, as well as the, the, the possibility just to find this packaging, which clearly is going to be a challenge. Um, so, so the, the lid and the label, if we can make an exception there, it feels like it would open up a lot, a lot of packaging to start off and then maybe we can improve that over time. Um, I, I definitely feel the same way uh, as Evo with the, with the logos too, um, you know, um, and what Kyle was saying, it, like, it's kind of hard to define, but you know it when you see it. Um, I feel like there's a ton of hand-drawn stuff that is definitely not appealing to kids. And lastly, uh, I want to just talk, I know it's not today's subject, but um, I think the the single biggest problem right now that's going to be holding up uh, craft growers and uh, and and possibly everyone really is just local zoning. I know through my uh, my journey through this process, uh, local zoning uh, has definitely um, ha definitely seems like it's going to be the single thing that's going to slow me down the most. My local zoning board just doesn't really know anything of what's going on. Uh, maybe. Um, some kind of uh, more extensive uh, reach out on behalf of the CCB to local zoning boards. Um, and, you know, it feels like a lot of them just want to really slow the process down, which clearly is going to be a serious problem if we want to have cannabis come October. Uh, so thank you all. I hope that you're having a great day. Thanks, Tito. Thayer. Thayer at Island Pond Cannabis. You there, Thayer? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello? Hi, right, we can hear you. Hey, I lost you guys for a second. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry about that. Um, it, was, it wasn't letting me unclick it. Um, I just wanted to, um, thanks for everything you guys are doing, by the way, really appreciate it. Um, just a couple things I wanted to mention that might or might not be helpful um, as I've been talking to all of my uh, manufacturers um, in great depth. Um, you have a broad blanket in, in speaking to and if I'm getting something wrong that I haven't read correctly, I apologize in advance. Um, so the caps that we are looking at are, um, you have this broad wording of plastic, and I'm not sure if that applies to, a, as a blanket rule, like no plastic or uh, recyclable plastic, because I, I've gone into great detail finding out what the plastic is made of and if it's recyclable. So I am just wondering if that's something that wants to be addressed, if you're going to be speaking to that based after this conversation with everyone. But the caps are PE and PP, and they are recyclable that we are doing. Um, and also, I don't know if this is ever going to be an option. Um, I know in the beginning there was discussion about whether or not the flower had to be in child resistant packaging or not. And then this marries with the discussion of 
reusing packaging. So there's a company in Los Angeles called Rose Los Angeles. And just this past year, they started doing home, home compostable refill pouches. So it gets rid of single use plastic. Um, and uh, I'm happy to email it over if anyone wants to see it or you know reach out. But um, basically, it's a brown paper packaging. It's not the most exciting packaging, but I do think it is interesting rather than creating more plastic top waste. But again, it's a, it's not the most beautiful thing, but I do think it's interesting. It's just not necessarily childproof and that would be for flower only. So they're just things I kind of wanted to throw out if that would have any wiggle room if you're really trying to be sustainable, um, how we can do that moving forward in a very environmental way. Um, cause I do agree. It's, it's, you know, the, the industry produces so much packaging and waste, um, and it's hard to get around it with the caps and everything. So just things to consider. Um, that's about it, but thank you for everything. Thank you. Uh, next, we have David Nathan. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Nathan. I'm the founder of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. Uh, I'm also the uh, co-designer of the uh, International Intoxicating Cannabinoid Product Symbol. Uh, you folks, uh, I had to miss the first few minutes because I was seeing a patient, uh, so I may have missed your vote, but I believe you may have voted on rules one and two, in which case uh, you have adopted the IICPS using the colors red, white, and black. Uh, and if I'm correct on that, uh, then I'd like to say thank you very much for adopting it. Uh, I'd also just like to add that, as you may know, the IICPS was designed in yellow and black. Uh, the idea being that it's a true caution sign uh, and conforming with existing uh, voluntary consensus standards. And as you may also know, it the the IICPS itself is now a consensus standard internationally uh, through uh, ASTM International, one of the main uh, standards organizations. It's also been adopted by the state of Montana in yellow and black. The state of New Jersey has incorporated it in yellow and black. And uh, the state of Alaska is now looking uh, at a proposal to use the IICPS and the only color they're considering is yellow and black. I understand that you guys wanted to have some um, color similarity to the states of Maine and Massachusetts, uh, and that's why you chose those colors. And, uh, you know, I myself had uh, kind of experimented with different colors early on before seeing that we really do need to go with consensus standards because once cannabis is legalized at the federal level, the ASTM standard in yellow and black will be um, the federal symbol uh, because of the National uh, Technology Transfer and Advancement Act, NTA, NTAA, yes, uh, that requires the government to use consensus standards where they exist. Um, something you should also know, other than the fact that eventually you're going to need to change the color to yellow and black, which will not go over well with uh, industry if they're already telling you, you know, giving you pushback about uh, some of the things that might disrupt existing packaging um, inventories. Something else you should know is that one of those two states, and I can't tell you which one, but between Maine and Massachusetts, one of those states is now looking at changing their symbol to the uh, uh, the IICPS. Uh, so if you think you're doing it to align with existing uh, New England states, uh, you might get left behind on that. And the other consideration is that, um, you know, there is now data showing the efficacy of the IICPS uh, uh, in actual consumer testing. Uh, and the yellow and black was thought to do well with showing caution. So I'm happy to share that information with you if that would be helpful. I imagine this is kind of a done deal, but I would uh, suggest that you guys reconsider. And thank you for your time and your work. Thank you, David. Ron. 
Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, if anyone can hear me right now, please let me know. Um, I'm having a slight issue. How about that? Is that better? We can hear you, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so this is Ronald Williams from Mr. Z Craft Cannabis. Uh, first, I want to say, uh, really appreciate everyone's comments and all the work that you guys are doing. Um, especially appreciate Evo and Amelia's comments. Um, they, I think, really speak to, you know, certain things that are, are very important as we move forward towards the, you know, market open as it relates to design. Um, so I do all of our design and I'm working on sourcing all of our packaging and it's really, really difficult uh, with these parameters, even though I understand the intention of that. Uh, but for example, finding glass opaque child resistant packaging as far as I've seen is near impossible. Um, there's a lot of hemp plastic, uh, post consumer hemp plastic packaging that achieves both of those things. Um, and I understand, you know, what, what Kyle was saying about the current recycle infrastructure in the state, but um, uh, I would just like, I guess, the state to reconsider that because, you know, that's going to be a very difficult thing to source. Um, and that might also create bottlenecks around that as a result, given how limited, uh, you know, that type of packaging is. Um, and then also, you know, one last thing uh, related to uh, the warning labels and such, you know, it, it is very interesting to see uh, constantly reprinted that it's not safe for children, for example, because, again, uh, it's not necessarily a scientific fact. Um, so, you know, those, the, a couple things to consider uh, from the CCB perspective, um, because especially as, you know, a cultivator of, you know, three young men who've had to raise their money from uh, friends and family exclusively, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to uh, observe these things while also trying to build a business for the first time. So really appreciate everybody considering this and thank you. Thanks, Ron. So I don't, oh, Sean? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, kind of touch on the whole issue of uh, packaging from a graphic standpoint and like know it when you see it. Uh, it's essentially kind of turning into the FCC and George Carlin bit of the seven dirty words. The FCC guidelines just say that a violation occurs if a broadcaster has violated the standards of the community. There's no list of words. It's just when someone happens to be offended and submits a complaint to the FCC. So either y'all would need to create a very exhaustive list of what graphics will be prohibited, be it color, font, or types of characters, or just drop the issue entirely, or that it would need to be updated or reviewed annually after a number of complaints have come in. But is that to that particular company? Is it towards that graphic style in general? And where do you all get tied up in that same kind of issue of the FCC of just being beholden to the standards of the community rather than an actual bullet point list of approved graphics and non-approved graphics? So uh, I just, I wish you luck with that. It's murky water. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, so anyone who's joined via phone, um, you can make a public comment. You star six to unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Kevin. Hi. Hello, we have a couple of folks that have unmuted themselves. Oh. Um, so I'll just kind of move us through that. Let's start with the yeah. uh, phone number ending in four, three, three, four. Thank you, Nelly. Hi, everybody. This is Ben Hervis. Am I coming through all right on the phone? Yeah, we can hear you, Ben. Great. Thank you. Um, Kyle, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge and appreciate something that you said about the fact that these packaging standards really have the potential to join uh, some of the highest standards in the country, if not set them, uh, coming from the Vermont public health world, where we also set some really incredible precedents and policies. Uh, it's just nice to see that continue with Vermonters um, and Vermont Cannabis. And then to build on the comments from my uh, peers, Evo, Amelia, Ronald, um, I just wanted to talk about the, I, I wanted to draw the connection that I think a lot of what they're asking is that for this first year to two years, 
um, that we just see more qualifications added to the waiver list, essentially, whether it is that somebody has already made the investment or that something, you know, I, I believe from what we've heard today, the, the waivers are going to be a case-by-case -case basis, and you seem to be very understanding to the multitude of reasons that someone might request one, um, but just, you know, acknowledging that list or maybe when we see if that will be written in the guidance, that would just be very helpful to see, you know, the prevention of waste. That's something that happened in California with packaging is that, you know, in order to, to achieve even a sustainable packaging rate, you have to order such a large quantity. And so if something changes on packaging that affects that, that packaging is already been purchased, that creates a problem. Um, and then additionally, you know, I'm not sure if this is already laid out in the rule. I believe it is uh, having to do with the, how products arrive at retailers from wholesalers, product manufacturers, that I believe it already has to be child resistant. But I just want to urge or, or publicly comment for all of our industry peers to really look at that and look at the fact that we're talking about reusable solutions here. And so if a manufacturer is able to recoup packaging from retailers, that may not just apply to the immediate packaging for the product, but it can also apply to child resistant options. Um, another thing that we've seen in developed markets are exit bags that are reusable so that essentially uh, any product that's sold that's not in a child resistant package immediately can then be placed inside of a child resistant exit package. Things to look at, lots of examples to follow. And that's my comment. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. All right, next we have the phone number ending in 7034. Uh, yes, hello, everybody. My name's Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hey, um, uh, mostly I just want to reiterate what my uh, fellow commenters have mentioned. Um, doing a quick search on, on a child Proof, or is it a child resistant? They're advertised both ways. The majority of what I see, in fact, all of what I see are a plastic of some kind. Uh, so I just want to reinforce the fact that maybe we need to pick a jumping off point that isn't uh, so far out uh, and allow some of those, those packagings. Um, Mason Top is the one brand I was looking at. It's a child resistant cover that goes on a glass mason jar. Um, sounds like a no brainer, but with a no plastics uh, criteria, that's, that's kind of a non-starter. So uh, I'd like to think that we could re-look at that and, and make that happen. And um, just thank everybody for all their efforts. Um, and that I'm not the only one with some of these viewpoints. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the phone? You can hit star six to unmute yourself. All right. Um, well, then we'll close the public comment period. Um, I just have a, a few just you know, responses here. I, I mean, I guess first off, you know, this pet ban on packaging is not a new concept. We've taken extensive public comment um, since we first proposed this months ago, um, and no one mentioned it. Um, and so really, you know, we were moving forward in a way that we thought was kind of the best way to do it. Um, and we recognize that there is going to be some hardship in adjusting to this we spent the first half of today's meeting discussing how you can get a waiver to this plastic prohibition. And it's not based on a percentage of the plastic. It's based on, you know, you demonstrating that you need a certain amount of plastic. Um, and so um, and the waiver follows the product, not the person requesting the waiver. That's right. Exactly. So once a waiver has been granted, that pro that packaging can apply to anyone in the industry can use that packaging. Uh, just um, a note that we have, there is a bill that looks like it's moving. Um, it certainly has cleared a very important hurdle that um, eliminates the need for child resistant packaging for cannabis flower. 
And I know a lot of the plastic lids that people are talking about with child resistant packaging are required because of that child resistance. However, if we eliminate that need for flour, then, um, you know, that in one kind of fell swoop eliminates a lot of the need for plastic in packaging of flour. Um, it also eliminates the opaque requirement and for opaque flour requirement. and retailers in that bill can package. Yeah. Um, essentially, uh, you know, those are the comments I had around plastics. And then just to kind of David's point about the yellow and black symbol, um, you know, when we decided on our symbol, it was um, in looking at every other state um, at the time. Um, the the this the yellow and black symbol got voted on um, in the kind of waning days of us approving our regulations. It was just a few weeks ago. I did send the yellow and black symbol to the health department. Um, you know, they went through a very robust process of approving not only the health warning but also the symbol, and they didn't have time to re uh, open that process in the kind of the last at the last minute. I do agree uh, with the commenter that the yellow and black certainly seems like it's going to be the standard symbol in the United States and internationally, and we will very likely have to adopt it at some point, but we just didn't have, you know, our agency partners didn't have the bandwidth to, to re-open um, their process um, on, that, on that symbol. But um, so at least for year one and in the immediate future, the white, red, and black symbol is the one that we're gonna use. And I guess that's all the comments I had. Anything else come to mind in response to some of the comments that we've heard? I would just reiterate that that much of the discussion today centered around retailer focused packaging to consumers. So in the situation where a cultivator wants to get their product ready to get to in within the supply chain to a retailer, these were requirements do not apply unless yeah. you're a cultivator like white labeling doing your own packaging for that retail establishment and consumer use then they would apply right just want to make that clear this doesn't i don't think cr package i think ben had mentioned something about cr requirements for bulk packaging and i don't think that that's a necessity right and to add the um the packaging that cannot appeal to people under the age of 21 is a legislative charge. So we're trying to meet that legislative charge. Yeah, I fully appreciate. There's a lot of really good artists out there that can get creative with this, but as with a lot of things, we're, we're trying to meet everybody in the middle. <laughs> so we implore you to meet us there too. Well, um, there's nothing left on the agenda, so we'll adjourn for today. Um, again, there is a social equity economic empowerment networking event on Thursday, um, five to seven. That is a kind of open question and answer situation. And so, you know, instead of kind of doing this dance that we do during public comment period, um, you know, Bryn and David, um, our executive director and our general counsel will be on the line answering people's questions um, directly. So a uh, great opportunity to kind of think about um, what's going on uh, in the industry, um, kind of the direction that the board is heading, timelines, all of those kind of questions that you might have. Um, so uh, with that, I'll just adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for attending. Thanks, Kyle and Julie, and um, see you next week.